Okay, so I'm recording and everybody's muted as uh, the usual thing. If you have a question, just unmute yourself and interrupt at any time. Uh, or if you uh, are more comfortable in, in using the chat, you can um, type something into the chat um, for a question. So uh, our uh, Torah reading at, uh, this week is the Torah reading for Rosh Hashanah. Um, uh, both days, first day and second day, uh, are found in the Machzor. So I thought we would use the Machzor today as our resource instead of the Chumash. But the, uh, the Torah reading is taken from uh, Genesis 21 for the first day of Rosh Hashanah and um, Genesis 22 for the second day. Uh, various synagogues are doing different things for Zoom services, as I talked about in the High Holiday Seminar a couple weeks ago. Uh, we have decided not to uh, read Torah in any fashion, unlike what we do on Shabbat, uh, where uh, we just read a selection from the Chumash, you know, not taking the Torah out at all and not reading from a scroll. Uh, but just reading from the Chumash, where we decided not to do that. And we, we recognize that with a two hour ish time frame that is reasonable for Zoom, we wanted to focus on one service that we could do like we normally do. And that's why it'll uh, essentially be um, Musaf that we will be doing in the morning. So we'll miss out on hearing the Torah reading and the special uh, trup the special tune for reading Torah for, for the high holidays, which is different from um, Shabbat and weekday and holiday tune. So um, we'll miss that and uh, miss the, the themes that uh, come out of the, the Torah readings too. So that's why that we have this opportunity today then to talk about the, uh, the Torah portion. Hi, Manny. We're using the Machzor as our guide today, Manny, for uh, the Torah readings. One more person is joining. Rita Rubenstein is coming on. Um, hi, Rita. We're using uh, the Machzor today for um, the Torah readings for because that's the Shabbat Torah reading this week, so is Rosh Hashanah Torah reading. So if you happen to have one handy, uh, that's good. So. The, the idea is, before we even get into the, the Torah reading uh, from Genesis 21, the, the first question, if, if Rosh Hashanah is the day in which we uh, remember, it's supposed to be the birthday of the world, uh, throughout the Rosh Hashanah service, we have allusions to that. In fact, right after the shofar is blown in Musaf each of three times. I'll just show you this. Um, for example, um, in the repetition of the Amida, not the silent Amida, in the repetition you have, I'm just turning ahead so that we get there. Uh, right. Uh, if you want to turn ahead in your Machzor to page 158, you'll see an example of exactly the reference um, it, it, that we have to um, Rosh Hashanah being the day of the creation of the world. Because right after the shofar is blown, it, we have this paragraph, Hayom Harat Olam, Hayom Ya'amid Bamishpat. So, Hayom Harat Olam, Hayom Ya'amid Bamishpat, something like that, that, the, that our choir sings. But so to, today the world stands as at birth, which is an interesting uh, translation. Today the world was conceived. Today all creation is called to judgment. Okay, so the ancient rabbis debated whether Rosh Hashanah, I'm reading the right hand uh, commentary there, Rosh Hashanah marks either the first day of the creation of the world or the sixth day when humanity was formed. The liturgical emphasis on the world today, on the word today, suggests that uh, this is no mere anniversary celebration. Rather, all humanity and all creation are recreated anew today. Okay, so that's that's one prayer of uh, several. Um, 
So, yeah, right. So, so Gabe, I just answered that question that you had there, right? Uh, so I just went, I just happened to have bookmarked uh, the Hebrew uh, edition of Wikipedia. Every now and then I'll go onto, onto Wikipedia in Hebrew just to practice my Hebrew. And uh, the Hebrew Wikipedia site just has like, uh, like if you go on, on just the, the, the English Wikipedia site, there'll be some random article uh, that in Hebrew is a, did you know? And then it's some article like today about some kind of salamander or something. And then also it tells you what, the, what today in the Jewish calendar is. And today is the third, is the anniversary of the third day of creation. With, with based on this commentary here, that Rosh Hashanah is the sixth day of creation, the anniversary of the sixth day of creation when people, when, the hum, when human beings were created. So that's interesting. And it just uh, reflects that debate in rabbinic tradition. Also in rabbinic tradition to begin with, was the world created in the month of Nisan? Because the Torah refers to Nisan as the first month. Uh, and the, the seventh month in the Torah, that is in the book of Leviticus and the book of Numbers, when we have the list of holidays to be celebrated throughout the year, you begin <clears throat> with Passover. Uh, and we don't know that's the first month until you get to it later in that, in that chapter, both chapters in Leviticus and Numbers, which describe the holidays in order, it goes Passover, counting the Omer, Shavuot, and then the first day of the seventh month. So that's how we know uh, Passover is in the first month. Not because it says it's the first month, but because the first day of the seventh month is a day <clears throat> of shofar blowing. <clears throat> so the first day of the seventh month, because seven is an important number in the Torah, <clears throat> uh, the first day of the seventh month would be an important day. And then the 10th day of that month is Yom Kippur. And the 15th day of that month is Sukkot. Okay, so lots of things happen in the seventh month. It's the rabbis who changed the calendar to make Rosh Hashanah the first of the new year and the first month. And Nisan then would be the, uh, would be the fifth month, I guess. I guess. Uh, Tishrei, Cheshvan, um, Kislev, no, it's the seventh month. Uh, Tishrei, Cheshvan, Kislev, uh, Tevet, Shvat, Adar, Nisan. Yes. <laughs> so my math is bad. So, um, yes, so the rabbis changed up the order uh, and uh, they, uh, for spiritual reasons uh, and the evolution of the calendar to focus on rabbinic ideas of the holidays as opposed to agricultural ideas of the holidays, right? So it makes sense to start the year when the first produce appears after winter, which would be in Nissan, the holiday of springtime and springtime being a natural new year if you're focused on agriculture. But if you're not focused on agriculture anymore, you're focused on more spiritual ideas and history, then it doesn't matter really what's the first month of the year. And so the rabbis changed it that way, but they wanted to give some historical <clears throat> basis for that. Not that the rabbis themselves are innovating and doing something new. They never wanted to come across as saying to the people that we're creating something new. They wanted to base it on something previously. We're just promoting something that was in the Torah. So for example, when the rabbis uh, it came up with a system of prayer that we should pray three times a day uh, to uh, be a substitute for sacrifice, people could still balk at that idea. Wait a second, the Torah talks about sacrifice, doesn't talk about a daily regimen of prayer. Who are you rabbis to tell us that we, um, th that we need to, uh, that we need to pray every day? So that's why the rabbis said, I'll get to your question in a moment, Carl, who sent me a question privately. Um, that's why the rabbi said, oh, no, 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 no. We're praying because Abraham set up the first, the, the morning service. Isaac set up the afternoon service and Jacob set up the evening service. So when we're praying, we're reconnecting with our patriarchs. So that's what, that's what the rabbis would do if they, if they innovate and uh, come up with a new, um, a new idea. 
um, I think something is, is in my mind about Shabbos candles and that Sarah, uh, Abraham's wife Sarah, is the one who instituted Shabbos candles, which is ridiculous, of course, because there's nothing in the Torah about that. But just because it's not in the Torah doesn't mean the rabbis can say, can't say that, the, that these um, figures didn't do it. So, so they project back their innovation of lighting Shabbos candles to start Shabbat, because the Torah doesn't talk about that at all, um, to say that we're going to do this, and we do it because Sarah did it too. And there's a midrash about uh, the Torah says that Isaac brought Rebekah into his mother's tent, and I think the midrash there has something about Shabbos candles being lit. So um, how can the world be judged if it was just created? No. Uh, what we're being judged today on the anniversary of creation. Okay, so that's, the, that's what it is, Carl. So um, that's, uh, the English tries to do that. And that's, we, we are judged today because, because humanity was created today. Therefore, every year since, on every Rosh Hashanah, we're judged for our actions. That's how, that's how that works. Okay. So uh, with all of that focus on creation, we would think then what should be the Torah reading for the first day of Rosh Hashanah? If the rabbis say that the Rosh Hashanah is the creation, the anniversary of the creation of the world, wouldn't we think that we read the first chapter of Genesis uh, on Rosh Hashanah, which is the creation of the universe? So the question is why? Why don't we read that? Yes, Jan, unmute yourself. Just a thought. Yeah. That if Rosh Hashanah is really the, the birthday or anniversary of humans kind of arriving on Earth. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of what we're celebrating is kind of that, that reinitiation that we're part of this Earth. Then maybe this Torah portion is the... Um, kind of the anniversary of the commitment between Hashem and us. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's a good idea. So if it's, uh, right, so if it's about the creation of humankind, which uh, according to the Wikipedia page, that Rosh Hashanah is uh, not the anniversary of the first day of creation, but rather the sixth day of creation when Adam and Eve were created, then yes, the, the relationship between ma man and human beings. So then I would just argue, why not read chapter three of Genesis about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and how they didn't listen to God and ate of the fruit that, uh, of the tree that they weren't supposed to eat and being banished from the Garden of Eden. That could have been a good story about what the consequence of our actions, or it could be Noah and the ark and God setting up the um, the uh, rainbow in the sky to kind of promote the uh, covenant between God and humanity that, that humanity would never be destroyed again. Yeah, Jan, unmute yourself again. So if we look at the, the creation of humans as being like a plus sign on, on God's side, right? Yeah. Then Adam and Eve eating the apple, that's a negative for the humans all the folks needing, you know, like Noah and the ark is because folks had kind of gone astray. That uh -huh. was a negative for the humans. Right. Whereas when um, Abraham kind of said, you know what, I I'll, I'm with you, I'll believe in you. And I'm there even to the point of possibly killing my own child that I waited so long for, uh -huh. then that's really the opposite. That's the human saying, right. I I'm, I'm here, I'm dedicated, I'm in this. Okay. All right, so that's that's a good idea too, and that's the reading for second day Rosh Hashanah. So is the is the story of Abraham and Isaac, and Abraham taking Isaac to the mountain to offer him up there in what is known as the Akedah, because in that portion Abraham is told to bind or tie up Isaac. So that word for binding or tying up is Akedah, the act of binding or tying. So um, that, that story is always called the Akedah story, um, but not the first day of Rosh Hashanah. So the first day you could argue leads into 
the second day, and really it's the second day Rosh Hashanah story that is the story of Rosh Hashanah. And that, that could be ultimate faith in God, no matter what's, hap what's happening to us in our lives, we put our trust in, in God. Um, and uh, so that could be, but still we're left with why the first day Rosh Hashanah is this Torah reading. And it doesn't, and the both days of Rosh Hashanah don't need to have the same, um, in other words, one doesn't need to lead in to the other. So first day of Pesach, second day of Pesach are two very different Torah readings. They're not, they're not they don't follow from uh, one after the other. Uh, first day Passover Torah reading is the beginning of the Exodus story. The second day of Passover is the, is the list of holidays from Leviticus. The seventh day of Passover is the Exodus uh, story of the Exodus and the, and the Song of the Sea. And the eighth day of Passover is from Deuteronomy. Now you can argue Passover is meant to be a seven day holiday. And so it's only one day yuntiv in the beginning, one day yuntiv in the end. Therefore, first day yuntiv, second day yuntiv, first day yuntiv, seventh day yuntiv do follow each other in the Torah. So um, the second day and the eighth day are just outside of Israel and those are extra readings. Um, so you could argue then that the rabbis do want to have the readings to be consecutive. So still we're left with this idea. The story, yes, Howard, I'm sorry, go so, ahead. So I think that this, with the birth of Isaac, yes. is actually the birth of the, uh, of the, of the Hebrew nation. Okay. That this is a rebirth of, uh, a, a reboot, if you will, okay. of, of, the original, of the original creation. Okay, so that, yes, and that's based on the promise that God gave to Abraham and Sarah that they would be uh, parents of a great nation. I I'm making it uh, egalitarian because in the Torah, God spoke to Abraham, but I'm assuming uh, Abraham shared that with Sarah. So to make it egalitarian, God spoke to Abraham and Sarah uh, to promise them that they would be parents of a great nation. And that promise what, don't think the promise was fulfilled with the birth of Ishmael. We know that, well, at least for Jewish tradition, in Muslim tradition, it was fulfilled with the birth of Ishmael, and Ishmael is the father of the Muslim people. Well, Abraham is, but through Ishmael. And that the Dome of the Rock, that shrine up on the Temple Mount, has the rock in which Abraham brought Ishmael to be sacrificed. Um, but uh, of course, in our tradition, it's Isaac. And so it's the birth of Isaac that f uh, is the fulfillment of that promise from God's side. Uh, um, so God fulfilling God's part of the bargain. And so now we have to fulfill our part of the b bargain, um, at least Abraham and Sarah and their descendants by being committed to God and following the covenant. And that too could be uh, a message that here on Rosh Hashanah, when we are judged, because really Rosh Hashanah, not just the anniversary of the creation of the world, but really it's a day of judgment. And it's called Yom Hadin, the day of judgment. And so that's what it's all about. Uh, it's the first day of 10 days of repentance, culminating in Yom Kippur, where we, we are supposed to recognize in all the services every day, three times a day, for those 10 days, we're focusing on God as king, as opposed to God in some other picture of God. So, so, so certain prayers, instead of saying Ha'el HaKadosh, for example, the holy God, we say HaMelech HaKadosh, the holy sovereign. And so by referring to God as king, we're, we're picturing God in judgment of us with a book of life before God, deciding who among us is going to be written into the book of life for the coming year. So, so that sense of judgment, that sense that we are, we need to prove ourselves to God, we need to state our case so that God will be merciful, not just judging based on only on objective facts about how we lead our lives, but also uh, we're, uh, we're pleading to God to, uh, to show mercy and compassion so that we will be, um, we will be uh, counted for good for this coming year. So, so 
uh, it's all about decisions that we make. It's all about the decisions that we make. If that we're in a situation, uh, a moral decision. So Lenore and I are in the midst of watching Ozark. Okay, now if, if you like Breaking Bad, you'll like Ozark. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't, I, it's, I'm not one to recommend TV shows, but it, it's a very gripping show. Ozark, it's on Netflix. I highly recommend it. The American Jewish University, which is the new name of the University of Judaism out in Los Angeles, has a whole series. I don't know if you, if you just go on their website, they have a really fascinating adult education and even just lectures with celebrities. So they had this past Sunday um, a conversation with the main writer of Ozark and uh, one of the female actresses who happens to be Jewish. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> so, so it takes place in the Ozarks and there are people with this, uh, you know, mountain kind of accent. Sounds like a Southern accent, but I, I, don't, I don't know. So this woman, Julia Garner, is uh, one of the leads in the, in the show and her mother's Israeli uh, and uh, did not know that. So when she's talking, she talks in a regular voice, but in the show, she has this thick Southern accent. Anyway, the point of it, why it was this, why they interviewed them this past Sunday, because the show Ozark, like Breaking Bad, and I think of Breaking Bad with Dennis being out in Albuquerque, because that's where Breaking Bad was, uh, was based. Uh, it's all about, you make one choice to do something that's not right, uh, illegal, uh, and then the domino effect that that has on your life and the people in your life. That's what Breaking Bad is all about without giving away anything about that show. But that's what, that's what Ozark is about too. And it's done brilliantly. The, the writing is really good. And um, there's, there's always a twist. Every episode, there's always something, something a little bit more that the main characters are doing that gets them down the slope of evil that makes it very difficult for them to climb back up to good. So, um, so I highly recommend watching Ozark. It's a little bit graphic in the violence sometimes um, and language as well. But if you can get beyond that, really the acting is really good and the, uh, the, the writing is really good too. So it's all about, uh, that, so that tangent about Ozark is all about choices that we make in life and uh, how we deal with the choice, right? So the first day Rosh Hashanah read, Torah reading is about God remembering. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sing it just so we get, get that sense of, oh yeah, that's what the Torah reading sounds like that we're not gonna hear this year. Vadonai. Uh, so I'm on page 100, I'm sorry, page 100 in the Machsor. And it's uh, chapter 21 of the book of Genesis. Va'adonai pakad et ka'asher amar vayas Adonai l'sarah ka'asher diver. Adonai took note of Sarah as promised, and Adonai did for Sarah what had been announced, namely that she was going to give birth to a boy in a year's time. So, so she gives Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken. One year from when we have to remember a couple chapters back when the angels appeared to Abraham and Sarah telling them that they were going to give birth. And Sarah starts laughing, hence the boy's name Isaac in Hebrew Yitzchak, he laughed. Okay, so that's why he has that name, because Sarah laughed, oh, really? I'm, that old man is going to get me pregnant? And, right? That's what she laughs about, and God changes the wording of that, uh, uh, and so we, uh, and doesn't, it tells Abraham what Sarah said, but not exactly that Sarah, that God doesn't tell Abraham that Sarah said, you're an old man. He changes, he look back in the story, and from that we get the idea that white lies for the sake of shalom bayit, peace in the house, is okay. Because if God could lie, 
then how much more so we're allowed to lie. So it's a fa fascinating, fascinating idea from the rabbis based in the Torah, from a, a careful reading, but you don't have to look, you just have to remember what, what Sarah said and then what God said Sarah said, it's clear it's different. God isn't, re God isn't telling Abraham exactly what Sarah said. So the idea of a white lie for Shalom Bayit an important idea. So that even that's an ethical uh, slippery slope, a white lie in your home in order to maintain peace in the family. Fascinating idea. Anyway, so the three, the three angels tell them they're going to have a baby. Then two angels go on. Uh, from there, we get the idea that one angels come on earth for a specific mission. So one angel of the three, their specific, his specific mission was to tell them of the uh, impending birth. The other two go on to Sodom and Gomorrah to meet up with Abraham's nephew Lot to tell them about the in, impending destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and then to save Lot and his family from those cities. So uh, then, then we get here. Now, you would think also in that this, the angel, that God tells Abraham of the plan to to uh, to annihilate Sodom and Gomorrah, and and uh, Abraham argues with God about that. So you would think that that could be a good uh, reading also for Rosh Hashanah. Why not? Just as Abraham argues with God for the sake of righteous people and for social justice, that could be a good a good reading for us too. But no, it's here. The reading is all about family. So, um, so Sarah gives birth. Abraham gave his newborn son, whom Sarah had borne him, the name Isaac. And when his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him, and God has commanded him. Okay, first, first boy in the history of the Torah and the Jewish people circumcised at eight days, because Abraham circumcised himself a chapter before at age 99, and Ishmael was 13. So, uh, uh, why, um, yes? Why, why, why circumcision? Was that a um, practice that was done? Uh, um, among that's a good question, other... Gabe. I, I can't answer. Can't answer that question. Why God decided that boys should be circumcised? Have no idea. So uh, you'd have to you'd have to um, Google that uh, biblical. What do biblical scholars say about that? And I'm sure they say a lot of Jew, even Jewish biblical scholars what they say about circumcision. Um, is it an identity thing? Is it a tribal thing? Was it happening in the Middle East at that time? I, I really can't answer those questions. All I can say from the Torah, it becomes a Jewish practice. What, what the basis of it is, I can't tell you. I, that I don't know. So, um, but here in this Torah reading, we see that Isaac is the first one to be circumcised at eight days. Because the, the commandment was, from now on, God tells to Abraham, after you circumcise yourself and Ishmael at 13 and all the members of your household, whatever age they are now, in the future, every male child born to you should be circumcised at age uh, eight days. So now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would suckle children? Yet I have born a son in his old age. The child grew up was weaned, and Abraham had a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. All is well and good in the Abraham and Sarah household. But then, oh, what about Hagar, the handmaid to Sarah, who uh, she has Abraham marry and have a child with him? What, what are Hagar and Ishmael up to at this point? And so the soap opera of the, the Abraham and Sarah home uh, now uh, becomes dramatic. The child grew up and was weaned, and Abraham held a, uh, right? Sarah saw the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham playing. Um, uh, so she sees, Sarah sees uh, the son, Ishmael, playing. She said to Abraham, cast out that slave woman and her son, for the son of that slave shall not share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly, for concerned a son of his. Okay, so we don't know what's going on. Ishmael is playing. Playing with who? Playing at what? What kind of game is he playing? What prompts what Ishmael is doing 
to make Sarah so upset to the point that she wants Ishmael and his mother, Hagar, who she calls the slave woman. She doesn't call him your wife. She could have said to Abraham, cast out your wife. Your wife, Hagar, is still a handmaid to me. And so cast out that slave woman and her son. Not your son. She could have said your son to make it even harder for Abraham to do this. Her son. So Sarah doesn't even recognize that it's Abraham's son. What, what, so the Midrash um, tackles these questions that uh, perhaps Ishmael was playing um, some strange kind of, perhaps even kind of sexual kind of game with Isaac, which is kind of bizarre, but that's what the rabbis are coming up with um, as one idea. Uh, yes, so Gabe, I'm just answering your question to that. It's all in the Midrash. Whether there's support for that in quotes, support, it's all Midrash. We don't know. All, if, if you only want to read the text, this is all we have. The Midrash has something else completely. Um, no, it doesn't have something else completely. It fills in the gaps for us to, uh, based on the rabbinic idea of who these characters are and the image that the rabbis want us to have long lasting of these people. So for the rabbis, Ishmael's a bad guy, Isaac's a good guy. So they have to make whatever Ishmael does into a bad thing or a questionable thing. So that here in the text, Ishmael's playing. He's 13 years old. Okay, maybe he's a little too old to play. You could think maybe he's on his Xbox all day, right? That kind of thing. Or maybe he's out in the field, I don't know, practicing bow and arrow, whatever, playing. Uh, whatever playing means, but it's uh, in the Hebrew, metzachek, um, it's the same word. It's the same word for the name Yitzchak. She sees him metzachek. What does that mean? So the rabbis play on the word metzachek. Uh, we know that Isaac and Rebecca later on are metzachek, that Avi Melech, the king of Gerar, sing, sees Isaac and Rebecca Metzachek. That is understood in context as a um, sexual thing, like the public display of affection. That's the Metzachek that they're doing there. It's Metzachek with a sin. So in Hebrew, the letter sin, not the Samach, the round Samach, but the letter Shin, but with the dot on the left side to make it a sin. Metzachek, the sin and the Samach as the, the sin and the tzadi often are interchangeable. So they could mean the similar thing. So if, uh, Abra, if Isaac and Rebecca later on are mesachek, and here Ishmael is mesachek, that also is a hint for the rabbis to come up with a midrash. Oh, the kind of playing that he's doing could be that kind of amorous, kind of sexual kind of playing. So that it's all midrash about that. Whatever it is, she wants them out of the house. And Abraham says, with God's urging, because that's, but God said to Abraham, page 101, do not be distressed over the boy or your slave. Whatever Sarah tells you, do as she says, for it's through Isaac that offspring shall be continued for you. Okay, so according to the story, God gets involved here. And so Abraham can be guilt free. If God wasn't involved and, and Abraham just followed what Sarah wanted him to do, then we would think, why is Abraham doing that? Why doesn't he stand up for Hagar, his wife, and Ishmael, his son? Why does, why does Abraham uh, accede to Sarah's wishes? But here, with God being inserted in the story, uh, was so was the story originally written this way with God uh, being involved? Was it after the fact put in so that we can understand that this was the decision that had to be made because we are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not Abraham, Ishmael, and Jacob? So to maintain those three patriarchs, we're going to do everything we can to ensure that Isaac is the one who is the focus and not Ishmael. So all these, these are questions 
um, is the Midrash Genesis Rabbah. That's one of them. Yes, you can find some of the stories in Genesis Rabbah. Most of them would be in there. There's also Tanhuma is a collection. There's also Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer is another collection. Um, and then there are random Midrashim that are found in the Talmud. So um, if you just Google Midrash on Abraham kicking out Hagar and Ishmael, uh, you'll come up with a number of things. Or if you go in Safaria, uh, the website Safaria, which is a great free website, and, and look at this verse, just go on into Bible, uh, Torah, Genesis 21, and then verse uh, 9. Um, then if you highlight that, it comes up with all the other sources in Jewish literature that are related to this verse. Uh, some of them are only in Hebrew, but some of them are in English translations. So that's another way to see what the rabbis had to say about this verse, and it tells you what, uh, where in Jewish um, uh, literature you find this, in traditional rabbinic literature. Um, so uh, with God being involved, then Abraham can be guilt-free about kicking uh, 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 kicking Hagar and Ishmael out. But again, it gets to the idea of uh, decisions that we're faced with in life. What are the competing factors and forces that are involved in causing us to make a decision? What are the, what do we, what, what do we have in one hand that outweighs the other hand? In, in making a decision. Do my love for my wife, Sarah, my love for my newborn son, Isaac, is that stronger than my love for Hagar and Ishmael? Do I want a peace in the house? Do I want a conflict in the house? Do I follow God? God says to kick him out. That's the ultimate, that's the ultimate thing that God knows best. So that's what the story has to. So these decisions so that, that what the Torah is telling us is that we should wait for guidance for, from God or do, do make our decisions based on uh, uh, our understanding of Jewish values. That's how we should be making decisions today. So, so uh, I, I do want to get to the, the reading for the second day of Rosh Hashanah and spend a little time on that, just, just a little. But, but um, let me, uh, okay, so I just want to read something from the commentary on page 100 on the right-hand side about why, uh, what, what the editors of Amachzor say is the reason for reading this today. Uh, the, rap, the second paragraph, the rabbis may have wanted to stress the continuity of the Jewish people, the birth of a second Jewish generation after the founding generation of Abraham and Sarah. So that could be a theme for Rosh Hashanah too, a new year, another year in which the Jewish people are still alive in the world. The Torah does not present us with an idealized heroic family, but rather offers us a domestic scene with clashing personalities and motives that can be variously interpreted as selfless or selfish. This ambiguity allows us to consider the complexity of our own motivations and how difficult it is um, uh, to understand ourselves and others. In, every, in any given year, we may identify with Abraham or Sarah or Hagar or the children Ishmael and Isaac. As we change, so may our sympathies with the different characters, right? So if we take God out of the story, we could we could understand Sarah's jealousy. We could understand, understand Hagar's vulnerability as not an equal member of the household. We can understand Abraham's um, place as patriarch of the family and, and the decisions that ultimately lay on his shoulders. So it depends on, on, on the year and, what, and the circumstances in our life. And that's the beauty of the story too, because uh, every year, we could, when we read it, we could focus on a different element of the story and say, oh, I never saw that before, or that part means something to me this year that I hadn't noticed before. So that, that's what makes Torah really the uh, eternal text that it is. It's, it's not, it's a, it's a nuanced, it's a nuanced text, which allows it then to be read in so many different ways uh, in so many different generations. Okay, 
So the Torah reading for the second day, page 103, then is this ultimate story of faith and blind trust in God. Okay, and uh, I would argue, I would argue personally that I can never see having, uh, being on the level of Abraham to be willing to do the thing that he is willing to do in this story. That is just uh, uh, remarkable as one word. I w depending on, on my mood, I could say it's indefensible sometimes, but there's no excuse. You, you tell me that God, that, that if an average person said, God told me to take my son and do this, you would lock that person up in a psychiatric ward right? That, that you would not have, it's not a reasonable defense to use that God told me to do this, right? That's not a reasonable defense at all today. And clearly someone would be, um, if someone commits a crime and says they did it because God told them to do it, they would immediately be uh, brought for psychiatric evaluation. And depending on the situation might be that they're, they can't, they're, they're, incompetent to withstand tr to stand trial, right? So today, <laughs> reading this story, now we don't say that about Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or Rebecca, or uh, Moses, or anybody else in the Bible who the Bible records as having a conversation with God. No, none of those people are seen to be crazy, None of those people, some of those people, um, people argue with them, are you sure God spoke to you? There are cases like that in the Bible in which people question the prophets as to whether God really spoke to them or not. And some of the prophets do some crazy things like um, Isaiah, I think, uh, or Jeremiah walks through Jerusalem naked with ashes on his head. Uh, just as part of what God told him to do to get the message out in a very uh, uh, dramatic way. So, uh, you know, if people do that today, if people act like this today, clearly uh, most people in the world would say they are crazy. It's like uh, in some religions, speaking in tongues is a religious thing, but for the outsider, that is unusual, uh, to put it uh, politically uh, in a nice way like that, but if not crazy, uh, in a uh, very direct, uh, harsh way. So that, that's something that I think the modern reader has a big problem with. Um, it's hard to overcome the context of the Torah in which God frequently talks to people, okay? So you just have to understand that context what that mean? What does that mean that God is talking to people? Um, is it really that God talks, or is it that the, the person who claims that God is talking to them uh, is in such a spiritual, mystical state that they they act as if God had talked to them? It's like what happened at Mount Sinai. Did, Mount, did God really speak to the entire community of Israel at Mount Sinai, or did something awesome and unique happen there that most of the people agree seemed to have been as if God was involved in Mount Sinai? So you can make the argument either way, and I'd say that gets to the argument about who wrote the Torah. Was the Torah handed down, written by God and handed to Moses directly as written? Or was the Torah a response to what happened at Mount Sinai? Either way, it's a divine book, a sacred book, but uh, the second choice <clears throat> that the Torah is a response, <clears throat> a human response to what happened at Mount Sinai, makes then the Torah a human book as opposed to a God written book. And that uh, determines then our take and our uh, willingness then to interpret it. If it's all written by God, then we might be uh, hesitant to interpret freely. But if it's, cre if it's written by human beings, then we might be more free. Uh, we might be freer in our interpretations. So with this, with this text, 
Vayahi achar hadvarim ha'ela. And it came to pass sometime after these things, all the events that happened in the Torah reading for the first day, Rosh Hashanah, Vaha Elohim and God nisa et Avraham, tested Abraham, or put Abraham to the test. Vayomer elav, Avraham, and God, and so God said to him, quote, Abraham, Vayomer hineni, and Abraham answered, here I am. Hineni. So Hineni, um, you know, and so I was taught when I went to day school back in kindergarten. Um, so that was a, a long time ago, uh, 50, uh, 53 years ago. Uh, they still said when, in, in Hebrew class in kindergarten, uh, answer Hineni when I call your name in the, in the roll, right? So maybe in Hebrew school, you remember doing that too. In Israel today, you don't do that. If anybody said in, he, in, in school in Israel today, Hineni, uh, when they're calling out the role, they would look at you funny. It's like you're talking Shakespeare and answering the teacher. So it's not done anymore. It's an old fashioned way of talking, but it used to be the way of talking for, a very, for centuries. So Hineni comes from here. Um, and um, the prayer that the cantor recites before Musaf uh, on, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, is the Hineni prayer. So Hineni or Hineni, it's just the vowel under the first nun. So if you, if you look at the Hebrew word Hineni, so it has the two dots next to each other. That's the, it's called a Tzere, and it's pronounced A, okay? And it also has a vertical line. That vertical line tells you that's the syllable that's emphasized. So in other words, we don't pronounce the word Hineni, or hineni, because the vertical line is there, uh, and the second syllable, it's hineni. So that's why. And always the trup, the trup mark is always on the syllable that needs to be emphasized. So that, that's just tricks of the trade when you're reading. Uh, our machzor and cedar and cedarim that we use, if a, if, a, if a word has a vertical line next to a vowel, no. The default is, if a word doesn't have a vertical line, the last syllable is emphasized. So when there's a vertical line, it tells you that another syllable instead is being emphasized. Yes, Jan, unmute. Just out of curiosity, the word that you said was the word for test? Nisa, yes. Nisa, is that related to the word um, Ness, miracle? Oh, uh, it's a it's a good idea, but no, it's not. Um, um, so um, I know my father's going to watch the recording of this. If he were watching live, uh, he would he I would call on him because he's the Hebrew grammar expert. So he could tell you what the three letter root for nace the word nace meaning miracle, which is also a word in the Torah for a banner that you're raising up high. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that's an exception to the three-letter root rule and only has a two-letter root that's just nun samach, or there is another letter in there that just drops sometimes, and there is a three-letter root for nes. Here, nisa, God tested. So I don't know what the three letters are. I can tell you if you look at the word Nisa, the second to last word on the first line, there's a dot in the Samach. Yeah, Usually, Samach oh yeah, Adriana, what are you saying? Nun Samach He or Nun Samach Yud. Well, Nun Samach Yud would not be. I, I would, I would, I, I'm almost sure. So it could be Nun so Vav Samach. Yeah. What? It, it comes from uh, Le Nasot. Yes, Le Nasot, yes. So it most likely would be nun samache as the three letter root. But again, um, I don't have the time to look at a Hebrew dictionary on my shelf now uh, to, to get the answer to this. But there is, so it's not the same word as nes meaning miracle, it's a different word. But the dot in the samach is a hint that there's a letter uh, or something that fell out that, uh, so dots in letters that usually don't have that in letters that don't usually have dots is there for grammatical purposes and it reflects something to do with a root letter that's missing. 
but that's about all I can say about grammar. If my father's watching now, he might be shaking his head vigorously to say, oh my goodness, my son, he doesn't, what, what kind of rabbi is he? What kind of Hebrew grammar has he not learned? So, I, uh, so my easy answer, Jan, is they are two different words. Uh, the grammatical answer, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe my father could give you a long lecture to tell you what that is. Um, okay, so, but the word for test is not the word in Hebrew for a test, a mivchan. So in other words, if you're signing up, if, you, if a teacher assigns a test, it's not a nisa, but a mivchan, which is a totally different word. This kind of test is a, um, uh, is a, um, a test of character. It's a, uh, it's, it's an understanding of what you're made of as opposed to a physical paper test that you're taking, uh, like the SATs or the LSATs or the MCATs, you know. So that's a, that's a different kind of test. So, the, so uh, after these things, God tested Abraham. God says to him, Abraham, and, and uh, Abraham answers, here I am. So who says that it's a test? It's the narrator of our story who says it's a test. It's not God who's saying it's a test. All, so the next sentence when God's talking to Abraham, Vayomer kachnad bincha, please take your son, et uh, yechidcha, your only son, asher hafta, who you love, et yitzchak velechlecha l'eretz moriah and go, take Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. So lech lecha. So chapter 12 of Genesis, God says to Abraham and Sarah, lech lecha, get up from your homeland in Haran and go to the land of Canaan. Here, lech lecha. So again, this is a frame to the story, the Abraham and Sarah story, chapter 12, and now 10 chapters later, chapter 22. Go, el Eretz Moriah to the land of Moriah, v'ha'alehu sham le'ola, and offer him up there as an offering, now, Ola, if we base this on Ola in the, in the book of Leviticus, then it's a particular kind of sacrifice. It's a burnt offering. So we don't know. Some scholars suggest if we use Ola here, like Ola in Leviticus, then it's a burnt offering. But is this a different kind? Can, is it right to compare this word Ola here in Genesis to Ola in Leviticus? Biblical scholars argue that because some biblical scholars say the author of this story is a different author than the author of the book of Leviticus. So that could be that that Hebrew word has a different meaning in Leviticus than it means here. So I'll just leave it more simply as offer him up there as an offering. And one of the mountains that I'll tell you. So God doesn't say I'm testing you, Abraham. God's telling Abraham exactly what to do. So the test, the fact that it's a test, is the narrator telling us about this. So who's the narrator? That's another question, too, that the Torah leaves unanswered for us, right? It's this, somebody is describing these events that happened. It's not happening live. It's not Abraham describing it. It's a narrator, some third person, is describing this event and, imp and imposing a, an opinion about that event. God, so, in other words, the narrator sees the event as a test. Did Abraham see it as a test? Don't know. Did God see it as a test? Don't know. We know that God is commanding Abraham to do something, and Abraham is following through. That the, the, What he's following through on, this particular command, seems to be a test of faith, and it could be fair to call it a test, but just keep in mind the narrator is calling it a test. So in the five minutes that we have left, I do want to say this is this. So there's a long uh, intro to this on the right-hand side of the page on 103 to try to understand this and make sense of this in a modern way, because uh, because it it opens up such a Pandora's box that God is doing, no, Abraham is doing supposedly what God told him to do. And it opens up such challenges, religious challenges to our life today. 
because it, because you can take it to the ultimate extreme of ISIS doing what they think God tells them to do. Or Baruch Goldstein in the cave of Machpelah in Hebron in, on Purim 25 years ago thought that God was talking to him to shoot up all the Muslims who are at prayer in the mosque in the cave of Machpelah in Hebron. So anybody claiming to hear God talking to them and commanding to do something is from here. Well, there's one, one, one example. I mean, Noah heard a command to build an ark, uh, but that's not hurting anybody. Uh, it's saving people. Uh, there are other command. God commanded Abraham to, to go with his family to the land of Canaan. Nobody got hurt in that story. Here, somebody's getting hurt, potentially. So for, for the sake of violence to be uh, from one human being to another human being and say that God commanded it raises great theological challenges. So that part of it is really ignored by the rabbis because it all ends up well, supposedly at the end, because the angel stops Abraham's hand at the last second. But imagine Isaac lying down and seeing his father's hand with a knife in it about to be lowered on his neck. And that image stays with Isaac, and there's a lot of midrash and modern commentary about that, the effect that, that, uh, that, that this event has on Isaac's life. Because in the Torah, Abraham and Isaac never speak again. After, after that event, they go their separate ways and they do not speak to each other. The Torah does not record any more conversation between Abraham and Isaac. So the fact about decisions that we make in our life based on, last, based on the first day Torah reading and here in the second day Torah reading, the, uh, the, the decision that Abraham makes, what he thinks is doing right because God is telling him to do that, what that, that impact is on his child, his child that he waited a hundred years to, get, to have, and what, what it has done to him, unbelievable. Some say there's even a midrash that Abraham actually did lower the knife, and the miracle is that Isaac was brought back to life. There's also a midrash about a tear, a tear that falls from Abraham's eyes and, and lands in Isaac's eyes, and that's what caused him to go blind early because Isaac, was his eyes were dimmed and could not tell the difference between Jacob and Esau, his twin sons who come to get a blessing. So how did his eyes dim? Oh, it's from the tears that fell either from Abraham or from an angel, either from the angel or Abraham that fell into his eyes that, that affected his vision in some way. So uh, fascinating midrashim about this story and the idea that Isaac uh, was brought back to life, that idea too uh, in the midrash also is related to Christian thought as well, that the Jesus story is not new, right? It's a it's, it's a reminder, Jesus' resurrection is a reminder of Isaac's resurrection. So there is that as well. I'm not making that up. I'm just telling you that's in the Midrash there, that Isaac being brought back to life leads to that. So Elizabeth, you have a question. We'll end with that for today. So un unmute yourself. Okay, go ahead. Um. I also read, or I don't know where I where I read it or heard it, honestly, um, that another interpretation that the rabbis had was that this was kind of an elaborate lesson for Abraham and through him to the Jewish people that... Um, we do not sacrifice our children oh. like right the, oh, absolutely like tribes do right They're, right 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 yes oh, so there is absolutely a, <laughs> yes elizabeth that's that's there too absolutely and uh, yes there are some there's some rabbis who say that that that's the lesson of the story that we are totally opposed to child sacrifice yes uh, but that i'm just giving you um some um I was offering some uh, different, deeper, spiritual, religious kind of challenges 
that the, the story has for us. So that, and that's really to end with this for today, because our hour is up, uh, that this is why, one reason why the rabbis have these two chapters as our reading on Rosh Hashanah. It's not, it, it could have been simple to have the first chapter of Genesis there, but the rabbis didn't want things simple. They, want, they, they knew that life, life is complicated, life is profound, the lessons we learn in life are, are deep and challenging, and therefore we need to have a Torah reading that reflects that. And that no matter where we are in life, um, how we read these stories as young people is very different than how we read it today, and will be different and how we read it, God willing, 10 years from now. And that's the beauty of these stories because we make decisions in life what are the factors that go into our decisions? What are the repercussions of that decisions that, uh, that, re, that resound over the, the years and the generations? So just as this, these stories have that domino effect uh, and ripple effect on people and generations, so too things we do in life as well. So I wanna wish everybody a Shana Tova. Uh, may we be inscribed uh, for good in the book of life this coming year. Stay safe, stay healthy, everybody. And I hope to see everyone on Zoom uh, this weekend for Rosh Hashanah services. Shana Tava. Shana Tava.